On today's Transport Evolved, the Apple Watch, the ever-expanding Galapagos Syndrome for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, a world of autonomous cars, and that final corner crash. These stories and more coming up next on Transport Evolved. <music> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. My name is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I'm sorry I just cut the end of that video. Must remember to wait a little bit longer because the way this all works now is the audio doesn't just carry on, it just cuts off if I click the click the thing off. I do apologize. Welcome to episode number 211 of Transport Evolved, recorded on Sunday, September 14th, 2014. My name, as it said along the bottom, is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and I'm your weekly host into the world of green and future transport technology. If it makes it greener, cleaner, uh, safer, that's us basically. And uh, thanks for the feedback from last week for the studio here. We've done, a, we've made a few changes. Uh, we've moved things around. A lot of people said that uh, I was too small on the screen and the studio was too big. Well, guess what? We've moved things around a bit and testing the studio out today. Joining us, Transport Evolved Old Hands. Uh, Scott Kronz and uh, Joe Duginzak. Welcome, guys. How are you today? Doing great. Great. Do you like the new studio? Well, honestly, I can't see it. <laughs> and I didn't see last week's show. so I'm... Oh, OK. Well, hopefully you'll get to see it uh, later. Uh, Scott, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very, I'm very well. Uh, you, you always have an extremely interesting uh, office. I'm very envious of your office. Um, it's it's a little cluttered. <laughs> well, so you you have a load of ukuleles and mandolins on the wall. Ah, uh, that's mainly ukuleles. Although on a recent trip, I did pick up something new. Oh, nice! That is cool. That's called a uh, baklamas. It's uh, from like, Europe. Um, yeah, it's from Greece. From Greece. Ah. It, yeah, it's. It is what it's a uh, if if an ukulele is the small version of a guitar, that's a small version of a bazooki. Oh, fantastic! Oh, that's 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 awesome. Um, and we and we never know. I never know where to start explaining you. You are uh, CTO of EA Games, EA Games. Uh, just even. just just vice president of of technology. There's oh, lots vice of president CTOs of now. Technology. So I, okay, right. Back, so back to my original title. From back to your original ago. title. And uh, you trained as a professional chef. Yes. And now yep. you're an EV advocate, and you get to pay. You get paid to help develop awesome games. I think that's probably the best <laughs> way of, of for right. all kinds of different <laughs> platforms. Um, and Joe, you are a uh, a lighting expert, aren't you? Yes, uh, or so I uh, tell people on my uh, series uh, Lighting Answers. At least uh, that's that's what I. It's not my day job, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely you, am passionate you, about well, it, yes. As we can see, you're perfectly lit. Much better lighting than me. I mean, it must be Well, said. thank you. Much better lighting. This is part of my me. home, but it's kind of like my home is like at least the current <laughs> setting for as I'm showing people how to do home lighting and convert to LED and, all, and decorate and all that kind of cool stuff. So thank you. Well, um, we've got lots to talk about today, and we're going to start off by just catching up with what you guys have been up to lately. Now, Scott... Um, every time we have you on the show, you come out with, you tell us what you've been up to in the world of uh, green transport. EA Games has a fantastic EV fleet. I mean, obviously you're based in Silicon Valley um, and lately you've been uh, just increasing and swelling in numbers, haven't you? Uh, yeah, we're, we have uh, about 62 cars on our corporate campus that are, that are either EV or plug-ins right now. Yeah, it just keeps growing. And do you, we, uh, do you all now have... Because you last time we spoke, you you had some new charging stations coming in. Yeah, so now we have a total of uh, across the campus fourteen uh, level two chargers, mm -hmm. uh, fourteen spots for people to bring their own one hundred and twenty, and we have two Tesla eighty amp uh, chargers right now as well. Uh, well, they're supposed to be eighty amp. There's the double ones, but they ended up. I think the max we pull is around sixty five seventy. 
Wow. So, so how many cars do you have to charge in the course of a day? Because I'm guessing not everybody who who charges uh, needs a, a a who has an electric car needs to charge at work. Am I right? Yeah, uh, you, we're, we're so right with the numbers we have right now. We also have two kind of waiting spots. Um, it's enough. It's about enough for half the people to get a charge if everybody sat in their spots all day. So what we have is a as a rule that. As soon as you're finished charging, you need to move out of that spot so somebody else can come in. So we, we tend to get between two and two and a half turns a day on the 240 okay. spots. Okay. And, and... Now, now, now six, six of those spots are public spots, mm -hmm. and that's where it can be a little bit of a problem. Right. Uh, those are, anybody can have access to them. Uh -huh. And sometimes we'll get a new driver uh, from one of the surrounding buildings that'll you know, like plug in their mm -hmm. uh, doesn't their play by the rules, <laughs> and they they don't realize that it's that it's charged, and they sit there all day long. And unfortunately, when we did that public spot, we don't really have a lot of areas that you can just pull the cord over mm -hmm. to another location. So uh, you've made. I mean, I don't. I hope you don't mind. One of your colleagues at, at mm -hmm. Electronic Arts did this fantastic um, kind of rules of uh, five EV rules of, of EV etiquette that is actually on the the website. Um, yeah, D Dino. Yeah, Dino is one of our UI designers who uh, just recently got a BMW i3, uh, and and he he last Friday he said, well, I'm going to take these simple rules that everybody knows and put it together in a little flyer so you can hand it out when new people come by, which is uh, move when you're finished charging. Don't unplug somebody unless you can tell that they're already finished charging, uh, and if you see a car next to you with its charge port open, plug it in. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then this is this is a particular one that we have problems with, you know. When you're when you're done, coil up the uh, the cord onto the charger. And, <laughs> I'm uh, looking yeah, at no this one has right seemed now. to come up with a, a charger that has a really nice cord, like automatic cord management system, have they? Well, we do in in Europe. I mean, it's called not having the the cable attached. I mean, we we don't have the cable attached in Europe. It's it's as simple as oh, that. Oh, okay. Uh, unless it's a rapid charger, in in which case then you, yeah you, you just plug it back in and it's a bit too big and hefty to to roll up anyway so yeah. oh, you know yeah. horses for courses um so scott um are you willing i don't know maybe we should ask if 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 your your um your ui guy would would mind making this available to everybody i think this is brilliant i don't see why not i'll i'll, I'll ask dino on uh, on monday but fantastic I, fantastic i just think it would be it'd be great know, to have it uh, moving forward probably the the uh you know Sign up to the electric vehicles at EA Redwood Shores is probably not appropriate for that part, but <laughs> <laughs> well, so you know, that's our that's our low tech thing that we do. It's not driven by facilities; it's all kind of user driven, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a distribution email that everybody subscribes to. Right, and uh, that's when you see messages like, you know, your your car is is hogging this spot. Please move. Do, do, do you ever get do you ever get people using strong language? <laughs> Uh, no, actually, it's really pretty good. I think um, early on we did have a bit of a, a volt versus leaf problem, mm -hmm. um, where it was the the leaf owners didn't think the volt owners should deserve uh, right away and <laughs> for charging because they also have a gas engine, et cetera, right, et cetera. Right, right. So I had to calm that down and say that you know all vehicles are welcome as long as they have a plug. Just make sure you move when you're charged. I think that's a fair enough comment. I think I think that's the way to move forward. Um, all right. Well, moving on then uh, to Joe. Joe, you've been busy lately with a lot of uh, of stuff, um, alongside obviously your 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 day job and and obviously your oh, lighting yeah. YouTube channel. Um, now this is a story that came up a couple of weeks ago, um, and I, so I just feel that we should give some backstory here. It's the Blink Network, um, which went bankrupt a couple of years ago. It was bought up by the Car Charging Group. Um, there's a whole, I mean, if you want to see the story behind the Blink Network, we recently did a story on Transport Evolved explaining the back history. Um, but Blink uh, Stroke, the car charging group, recently changed the way it charges people for the electricity they use when they're plugged in in a public charging station. Now, originally, um, they had flat fees, didn't they? And then they moved to, to per kilowatt hour and per hour charging. Now, in the states well, was, where they can charge. It was charge. still originally that they uh, they had the flat fee for the level three, just to be clear. Right. And then level two was uh, by the hour. It right. was always by the hour. And and but the way they charge for that now is slightly different, isn't it? Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. 
they uh, they move to and, and part of their move is a good one. Uh, and I want to be clear about that. They move to uh, in certain states, it's you're paying per kilowatt. So it's for usage instead of like by the hour, because sometimes, you know, you'll charge for an hour and a minute and you'll get charged for, you know, two hours. Um, mm -hmm. But anyhow, they uh, and in some states that can't charge per kilowatt, they charge per minute and it's rounded up to like the next 30 second interval. OK. And and so that's also good because, again, you're only being billed per, uh, you know, for what you use, what isn't a good thing is that there is a hidden uh, very large price increase from the original blink rates in this uh, in this change. Okay and it, it depends on where you're based isn't it so if you're based in a state where you can be paid per kilowatt or kilowatt hour you uh, it's different to if you're in a state where you're charged by time as well isn't it? It is it's it's between, if I look at uh, the information that they put out, which I've kind of put into this petition, which we can talk about at some point, um, the, depending on the state, it, it, can be as, it can be starting at 40 cents, basically about 40 cents per kilowatt hour, which is obviously much higher. They're marking up uh, electricity rates by quite a bit, um, or 4 cents per minute. Uh, oh. Which uh, and that's like the blink member rate that translates to in certain states like Arizona is not a per kilowatt state, so that means that instead of paying a dollar per hour like I was, if you translate the numbers um, for say a three hour charge, I'm now paying uh, what would that be seven seven dollars and twenty cents uh, for a three hour charge instead of three dollars. Wow. So it's more than doubled wow. um, what it was. So and I was talking about or, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. So, so what you're doing is you're essentially doing a, a, a petition, aren't you, to, to try and change that? Yeah, and I, I really thought about it, and if it, uh, I, just, I just thought you know, we need to put some pressure on it and uh, on them. And as it turns out, of course, here in the U.S., it's, we're about to begin this National Drive Electric Week uh, with all these events going on. And so there's going to be some publicity and some uh, obviously media coverage of, of that. And social media, people will be talking about it across the networks. So I thought, you know what, let's just launch it and let's see how it goes. Um, so what I have done is I've launched a change.org petition. Um, and I've shared that through my personal cha my personal uh, social networks thus far, because I only launched it at about midnight last night. And then I thought also to step up the pressure to, so it's not just a petition drive. It's also now we're asking people to boycott using blink charging stations where possible. Because we know that some people, uh, like myself here in Phoenix, Blink is the incumbent. Like 95% of all charging stations here are Blink. And the ones that are uh, owned by ChargePoint and uh, Volta are in fewer numbers and they're not in necessarily convenient places. Um, the second reason I launched the petition is because my own case, um, what I've gone through over the past year and a half, you know, getting working uh, with my own apartment complex to get chargers installed by Blink, which was free to them. Uh, then in a separate move, once they were installed, they raised everyone's rent in the complex by nearly 20%. I made the decision mm. that I didn't want to pay an exorbitant amount of rent for a small apartment, and I moved. And there were no chargers at the uh, new apartment complex that I moved to. So I am 100% reliant on public charging infrastructure. So now... They're taking advantage of those type of people who don't have the ability to charge at home on their own relatively inexpensive electricity. And now I'm paying, uh, I ran the math, and I'm now paying more than I was per, per mile, if you, if you run the numbers. I'm paying more to charge up my leaf than I was putting gas in my uh, second generation Prius. Wow. And that's, that's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, just I can... Ridiculous. I can... I can imagine that causing some problems there. Um, Scott, I mean, how often do you charge publicly? Uh, well, I think we, with the cars we have, we probably only publicly charge when uh, m maybe four or five times a month. I'm, I'm excluding work. I charge pretty much every day at work and at home. Uh, and that's uh, that, That's primarily what I'll do is get a 
quick charge, maybe at the Stanford Shopping Center, things like that. So it's I don't use it that often. Uh, I do, though, early on when there were a lot less cars, I would use as many as possible just to show people that it existed, you know, like in front of the Costco's with my RAV4. And, but nowadays, there's just not a lot of not a lot of need for it. it interesting um, thing is the you know electricity here in California is relatively expensive. Uh, at work, though, we use so much electricity ADA that we have a flat fee with PG&E of thirteen cents a kilowatt, wow. uh, which is that's fantastic. Great. That that's a <laughs> that's, that's one yeah, decent that, discount, isn't it? Yeah, occasionally, you know, like, sometimes we get people who say. Uh, how come I don't get free gas to fill up my car when these electric cars get, you know, get electricity? And I explained to them that at 13 cents you know, a kilowatt, uh, we're talking about a, you know, a less than a gallon of gas. So if they want a gallon yeah. of gas, then we can figure that out if they want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I'll, I also explained to them that that uh, that's less electricity than what they're using for their multiple computers and their oh, development kits for Sony true. and Microsoft. That's true. And electricity doesn't always have to come out of the ground. <laughs> that's true. Either. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, the other stories of um, the segment. So uh, as those who are watching Transport Evolved who haven't watched it for a couple of weeks will notice, I'm trying to make the first part more about the guests and we talk to the guests and find out what they've been up to. Um, and then we move on, move on to the stories. And we're also discussing fewer stories, but just trying to make this the show higher quality shorter time uh, kind of not bite-sized but but more concatenated it's it's um i hope you like it um but we are going to talk now about formula e um the first formula e race took place uh yesterday and it was a very exciting race and there's there was a, there's been lots of reaction to it um if you watched it in the uk and it was streamed on itv4 in the uk and i know it was on I think BBC, not BBC, BT Vision I think also. Um, I know that some American channels had it, didn't they, Scott? Yes, yeah, I recorded yeah. it and haven't watched it through yet. It okay. was, uh, I think it was on Fox Sports or something. Are we allowed to talk about it then? There are some spoilers. No, 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 I, I, I've seen the crash. Oh, you've seen the crash, okay. <laughs> so um, really, really exciting race. And I mean, I watched a bit of it with the kids and the thing that struck me that I didn't expect was the noise. The high-pitched whine from those electric race cars spinning round the track in Beijing, China. It was it was kind of addictive at the same way, but there was a little bit of me that went, this is starting to get a little annoying. It's a bit loud, a bit high-pitched. It's not quite what I'd expect, um, but that's because they're pushing those motors all the way, all the way, all the way. Um, obviously, uh, very exciting all the way to that last uh, corner. Nick uh, Hydefield was in first place. Um, it was Nicola Prost uh, in second. Uh, no, sorry, Nicola Prost in first place and Hadfield in second. And Hydefield went for first place. Prost shut the door or didn't. And there was a massive, massive crash. Um, well, I guess the fans got some excitement, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That was, that was a pretty amazing you, you see the, the the footage from the car and it, it doesn't look like it was that bad of a hit then you see that the both tires smashed in and then it flips up into the air that's pretty drastic yeah yeah and, and we're going to try and do a, a report on it in, in the coming days and actually I should probably mention this now I'm looking for someone at Transport Evolved to be our effectively our go-to person for Formula E um, I don't have time to sit down and watch all the races all the time so if somebody wants to be our Formula E correspondent get in touch I would be interested in chatting with you um, an interesting uh, sort of Twitter conversation happened after the race um, Nico Prost said um, I feel very bad about the incident, and after looking at the videos, I understand that I am responsible. I just did not see him feel very bad. If you watch the in-car camera from Nico Prost, you see that he, uh, Heidfield was just kind of behind him, just a little bit, and he would have seen him overtake. He would have seen him go into that space to overtake. It's a fairly common manoeuvre, um, but he was, I think, probably in Prost's blind spot, and Prost is you know, blaming that it was his fault. I feel just less, uh, less happy about the whole thing. Just to let everybody know, I am fine physically. And then he says, could slash would slash should have won that. Now nothing. He's obviously very disappointed. Um, 
And then Nico Pros said, the most important thing is that my friend Nick Hydefield is okay. Sorry again, Nick, you know I would never do something like this. Um, it's a, it was a sad, sad crash. Obviously, they both left the race. And and uh, <laughs> and in the end, uh, Lucas de Grassi won, you know. So that's the, the nature of racing. But I do wonder if, if that last lap push was a result of this fan boost i think it might have been what do you guys think did you did you see I it don't Sergio? have a lot of uh comments on it because i didn't see it okay um but uh I, you know obviously we know from from racing not not just formula e but uh, all the other uh, types of auto racing that uh crashes happen uh and whether it's i think you're you're saying that it's sort of Perhaps driven, driven by the fans, I don't know, you know, but people people get into situations and you know you're you're driving at how how many miles an hour yeah. and uh, critical errors can happen in a millisecond. Yeah, yeah they can. Um, I think I think the thing that I was interested in trying to find out was because obviously Formula E has this this fan boost feature. You vote essentially you, during before the race, you can vote up your favorite driver and during that last lap they get a boost which they can be given as a button they press and it gives them so many seconds of boost power oh i did not know that and wow. i okay. just have this thought that that was the result of of uh, of nick pressing the boost button which gave him that extra acceleration to get past prost except prost shut the door on him and obviously the rest is history uh, am i being a bit skeptical about that scott but it, it, it's very possible that that was was going on. But uh, when I was when I looked looked at the various angles of it, uh, it looked a lot like uh, you know Prost was going into his corner, the last corner. Yeah. So he was turning out anyway, and then uh, you know Heidfeld was in his blind spot coming up and then trying to cut it close. Yeah. So but I, you I know, can see so it work now they're both race car drivers, so they should have had a, a much better awareness. Yeah. But you know, stuff like this happens at high speed. Yeah, and I think I think you know, if I was looking at it from a race car driver's perspective, I would say Highfield had had the line. Cross lost the line. He was on the outside. And actually, if you look earlier on in the ah. race, there was a moment when exactly the same corner, two other drivers doing exactly the same thing. The driver on the right yielded to the driver who'd overtaken him on that corner, who was coming in, who had the line. And that's the smart thing to do. If someone's overtaking you and you're barreling into a corner, you do, you put your foot on the brake, you let them go through. Obviously it was the last corner, so there was probably quite a lot of testosterone and adrenaline flying around, but you know, there we go. Um, all right. I don't. I don't follow racing all that much. But is this boost feature exclusive to the uh, Formula E? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's a new yep. feature okay. so to Formula E, and I. I disagree with it, frankly. I, I'm. I've. I've always been a bit kind of. Mm, I don't know about this. I don't know how. How you feel, Scott? Uh, yeah, I can't. I don't really know if it's a gimmick. I mean, it's. It's so different than uh, any other um, racing. You know where you you know this the kind of fan base stuff i know what they're trying to do i don't know if it really makes a lot of sense I mean, maybe how it'll disappear after did... this year i hope after, it does if they, if they'll pull the black box from the you know the vehicles and analyze the data and figure out figure I'm, this out i'm sure there's a hundred people now yelling at me at their screens turning off their ipods <laughs> or whatever they've given up <laughs> they've not bothered to listen to the rest of the show because i made such a dog's dinner of that all right final bit of the segment um tesla this week massive incentives agreed in the state of nevada for the gigafactory obviously between you guys basically sort of in between right. you two guys um now at least they finally announced it at least they finally announced it now it was announced uh, not last uh, not last week but the week before it was a big press conference you know musk was there governor of, uh, of um, nevada was there that site in northern uh, nevada near reno the Reno Tahoe Industrial Center has been chosen as the site of the Gigafactory. We've known that. Uh, but the interesting thing was the governor then recalled all of the legislature the f last week to bash out those final incentives. Some interesting kind of uh, some interesting bits of information that come from that. At 1.25 billion in tax breaks and abatements. There were three bills. Under Assembly Bill 1, Tesla will be guaranteed eight years of discounted electricity from Nevada Energy, expanding the existing discount period from the current four years to twice that amount. 
Uh, it's worth about $8 million over the course of the next eight years in saved electricity, and Tesla will be required to sign a 10-year contract with the same utility company. To I thought power the grid. entire complex was entire supposed complex to be off the, off the grid. Off the grid. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting well, thing, is interesting isn't it? Thing because thing. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm Ooh, we've got some we've got some audio coming back audio there. Coming back. Uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to fade down Scott because that's where it's coming from. Sorry Scott, uh, your audio is now picking back up. I'll have to fade you up again in a second. Um they were originally going to talk about being off grid I think, but obviously now purchase the the grid from Nevada. Par purchase yeah, the the, the image Nevada. that I've seen uh online which shows the the facility as like a diamond shape yeah. uh shows the whole thing being covered with solar, which may not produce enough for the entire facility, but right. I thought I always th would think an electric vehicle uh, uh, battery plant by Tesla would be uh, pretty green, I or think, as green as possible. I think I would probably guess that Tesla is going to be grid connected, but it's also going to have the solar Supplement. panels and probably sell it back yeah. to the utilities. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, probably, probably so. Although I don't know what the going rate is in Nevada, but I'm guessing that electricity is relatively cheap there because mm -hmm. uh, of the dam that, yep. that, that you know, hydroelectric that they produce. Yep. Um, all right. So other parts of the incentive, and I'm reading them here, so you have to forgive me because I can't keep it all in my head. Um, the, you uh, can't? <laughs> can't. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, most, in order to, to obviously to have these, these breaks, they have to take money from elsewhere. And the two places that money was taken from uh, primarily was an insurance industry um, a tax break that Nevada has been running for many years, and also um, a, a movie production credit. So, uh, but even that, you know, it was unanimously voted in both houses, both passed, um, and also Tesla can now sell its cars in state as you know as many <laughs> as many showrooms as it wants. So that's going to upset the auto dealers. But it was it was really, uh, I think, a rather good deal, don't you guys think? Oh uh, yeah. Definitely, and Nevada is known for being very tax friendly. Right. And yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they needed some place that was relatively close, uh, you know, to the factory, so that they could ship the batteries over at a at a low expense. So Nevada is, you know, perfect perfect spot. That's uh, that's where Amazon used to have all of their warehouses before they settled with California on the on the tax deal, where they would start paying yeah. tax. Yeah, I think it's very yeah, good. I don't I don't know that a whole lot of deals these days really get done without tax incentives. It's obviously a very large tax incentive, but it this this just this seems to be the way things go. Yeah. So congratulations to Nevada. I think They've Nevada plenty, I of, think... plenty of land. And and sorry to Arizona for losing out. Not that Arizona really. Well, we I tried. Did, I, I guess the question now is going to be is, I guess I thought that they had arranged a like Arizona I was changing its mind about Tesla to go for the factory. Now right. that we don't have the factory, is Tesla still going to be allowed to sell directly here or have they just said, nope, forget it, sorry. Um, I, good question. I don't know the good question. I think perhaps no. I think Arizona. <laughs> Arizona might be a little bit too uh, red for that. Behind. Nah, I don't know. Um, all right. We're going to have a quick uh, break here, and I'm going to talk to you about what you can do to support the show. Uh, Transport Evolve does rely on your donations to keep us running, uh, to help us with the studio, to help us with the tech. Uh, there's a whole load of tech and all sorts of other stuff uh, that, that we use to keep the show running and to keep everybody happy. And uh, if you want to help support the show, what you can do is go to www.transportevolve.com, and on the right-hand side of that page, it's what we call the right rail, there's a subscribe button or a donate button, and you can agree to take out a monthly or uh, a monthly subscription. And there are four different levels of uh, subscription. Uh, they all um, end up. Uh, you get the same amount of. of uh, you get the sorry. You get the same benefit, which is you get to know that you're supporting the show. Uh, but there are four different levels. So we've got level one, level two. We've got fast charge. And then we've got supercharge. So if you're an EV driver, you'll know that level one is the lowest and supercharge is the fastest. So I think it's uh, five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, and 40 pounds. I think those are the, the different uh, donation amounts every month. Um, we do have lots of people who help donate and they are helping us build the site, uh, pay for the servers. I think it's about three or $400 a month uh, to keep the server online. So if you would like to help us uh, keep the site running and Stop us being 
out on the street, then please do consider donating. We thank you for your kind support. All right, on to part four. Sorry, part four. Part two, where am I at today? Uh, Apple and its iWatch. Sorry, Apple Watch. And its iPhone 6 and its 6 Plus. Uh, did you all watch the Apple announcement this week? Well, yes. I tried yes, uh, to watch live. <laughs> And you saw and that wonderful else. Chinese lady giving Chinese, giving the... yes, and strange truck announcements and Denny's advertisements and all kinds of things. But yeah, I'm it sorry. It was very exciting. It was very exciting. So obviously the iPhone six and and the six plus. Um, Scott, you've got uh, you can show us, uh, can't you? The the iPhone six. He's iPhone got one. six and six plus. There you go. It's a top secret. He's not going to tell us how he got those ahead of launch. <laughs> These are fake. They're fake, but they're very realistic. They they're are good, very, uh, They are to scale. Yep, to scale even with the uh, lightning, and uh, and uh, phone jack right there. It's amazing. Yes, can you, you un can... can you unlock them with Touch ID? Uh, <laughs> they're unlocked and unmovable. Nothing happens. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that's did, the, that's that, the that, uh, brilliant thing of 3D printing. These, uh... Yeah, part of it was uh, with you. We we're trying to figure out uh, internally what the size of these things were. Like right. especially the watch, um, a lot of the close-ups and the videos of the of the watch made it look like it was too big. Uh, yeah. So I, I I I did the 3D print of them to to actually take a look, and there it's actually not too too bad. So if you see this, this is the largest one, and compare that to the, uh, the pebble. pebble. Hey. It's so did it's they actually old... have the the like the the full dimensions besides just you know the you know the width I guess you know the width and height of it or the length of it because yeah, some, some people were saying it's really really thick yeah but it's, on, what's, when it's, it's worn it didn't seem like it was that bad on people's wrists part of it is this the bump on the back here with the sensors so with their, if you measure it all the way out to that extent it looks like it's a lot thicker and in fact it is significantly thicker than well not significantly but thicker than the uh, than the pebble, but when mm. you when you when you take that and you know three D print it and put it on your wrist, you realize that kind of sits down into your you know into your flesh. I don't know how right. comfortable that will be in metal, but and how it's, it's how really tight not that it's big. supposed to be. You know, it's going to be interesting to see. So the 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 connection obviously with with future cars and 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 whatnot here is that we've had two kind of very kind of techy stories this week. Um, talking about, about Apple products and moving forwards. The first one being that BMW uh, i apps are going to be coming to the Apple Watch. They demonstrated at the event, weren't they, Scott? They did. Yes. Yep. Yep. And um, what do you think? Because did you end up with a BMW i3? I know you were talking about it. No, no, I'm still still with my my leave. Uh, the the if the Rex if the Rex version had gotten the white stickers, I probably would have gotten one. Uh, but when it uh, when they uh, half the size of the uh, gas tank and got the green stickers at that point, you know, it was a bit shaky whether anybody's going to get any more green stickers. Uh, so I decided not to. And now there's so many new ones coming out. I mean, what I, what I really think I'd like to get is the uh, the the uh, uh, the the Golf uh, hybrid that's not bringing out in the U.S. right now. That, well, it's going to be you know, the, the Audi A3 Sportback, isn't it? So it's the same yeah, car. Yeah. So are you going to get that one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Audi is not my favorite brand. No, no, it <laughs> isn't. Maybe, maybe the trick would be to buy it and then get the Volkswagen body panels and put on. And just put it on it. Just, just put a different badge on it. I know but that. I, yeah. The, 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 I like the idea of a, of a small, uh, high performance, uh, you know, electric electric car. Well, it's funny because uh, next week's guest and I were taking it up a mountain a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and I was she she would she'd driven for a bit, and then I drove up the mountain, and I was in with the paddle shift gearbox, and I was being a little bit reckless, I might admit, and and might be making the engine make more noise than perhaps it ought. Um, but anyway, so I app for Apple Watch, which is pretty cool, and it looks great. It looks just like the iPhone version of the BMW i app. Uh, which allows you to check on your state of charge, allows you to find out where your car is, etc., etc., etc. I would expect all the major automakers who make plug-in and future cars that are connected in any way, shape, or form would do that for their cars. Um, I, I, mean, I expect that Mercedes-Benz is at the top of the list. It does the, the. It's already got a connection, an app for the Pebble, hasn't it, Scott? 
Yes, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously there are Tesla apps available for Pebble. I expect them to come to Apple Watch as well. Uh, the question is, are you guys going to get one because of the car connectivity? Scott, would you get one? Uh, well, I'm going to get one because I have one of everything, but <laughs> it's not probably not specifically for for the uh, connectivity, Just but just to, to, to see what it's like. And the reason I got the, the Pebble uh, on the Kickstarter was to, was to find out what why somebody actually would want one of these right and i think uh, you have you found too, that Nikki, out so. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's um it's the yeah it, uh, it's pretty limited but essentially what happens is you've got a phone in your pocket or somewhere near you in bluetooth connection uh you, if you set up your alerts correctly you get a silent vibration and a message on your watch and that's that's great for all sorts of things yes They're, yeah uh, you're driving in a driving in a car and you get a text message. You don't pull your your uh, phone out because you get a ticket for that. But you can glance at your watch and see what it says. It's true, actually. But apparently, are they going to eventually UK... make tickets for looking at your watch? Actually, that apparently that's that, the next thing. That's that's true in the UK. If you look at your if you're playing with your watch and it's a smart watch, you can get a ticket just you would if you were wow, really? driving. Yeah. Um, but the thing <laughs> I like about the industry. Pebble again. We're going so down a rat hole here. Uh, the thing I like about the Pebble is that it has a, you know, I do my four square check-ins on it and I do navigation with it. If I'm in London, I don't know where I'm going. I have it on my wrist and uh, it navigates for me and it, it vibrates every time I need to change direction. I just look at the watch as if I'm looking at the time and it tells me which way to turn. And that way I don't look like a tourist or someone who doesn't know where they're going. I'm just someone who text their watch a bit too many times i also use it for, to, to pay for my coffee when i go to starbucks because there's an app on it that displays you can get an app that displays the barcode and so i just hold it out to the scanner oh cool and it beeps and i have to pay yeah. for it and and it freaks all the starbucks staff out some of the local starbucks know me and they're like oh yeah you want to pay for it like that that's fine but if i go somewhere you know away from off the beaten track and they don't know me and i just hold my watch up they're like wow that's so cool how did you do that <laughs> which is you know very cool. All right. So second Apple stroke future tech story is uh, Apple, sorry, Apple's iPhone can now unlock your Tesla Model S or it soon will be able to because Tesla released uh, at the end of the week uh, the OS 6.0 um, to Tesla Model S owners. It includes improved sat nav functionality, uh, a new calendar functionality, improved power management and the ability to lock and unlock your car remotely using your, your smart uh, phone. Um, this is the way it's moving forwards into the future, uh, uh, isn't it, Joe? I I think so, and and there are there are features honestly uh, within because uh, I have a 2013 Leaf. There are features within the app that I wish that they would do. They would enhance it a bit more, uh, such as things like this remote unlock, um, things like uh, starting. Well, you can start, but you can't stop charging. Um, there, there's a number of things. That, uh, that that I can think of, and I can't even. I'm sure I can't even dream of at this point that we can do um, with our smart devices, because really that's where it's going. You yeah. know, I think ultimately physical keys may still be some sort of backup, but I think that it ultimately, probably five years from now, it'll just be standard on on many cars. I'm not going to say everything, but um, with smart watches or or wearables, we're not really sure if the watch category is going to be something long term or something wearable. Uh, you know, some other type of wearable is going to be the the thing, you know, into the future. But uh, I definitely think this kind of technology is going to be out there. And congratulations to Tesla owners. Yeah, I, I'd love to see it. And obviously, there was that woman a couple we talked about last week who who lost her her Model S and discovered it was lost, and then used her iPhone to track it. I think that's brilliant. All right, staying in the technology sphere, gentlemen. Uh, GM has uh, been demonstrating its e E, sorry, it's NV 2.0 this week. Self-driving city car, uh, top speed, uh, limited top speed, range of about 20 miles per charge. It's not going to be something I think that you will own, but it's something that could be multimodal. Now, um, Scott, I don't know how long your commute is every day. Uh, it's about 24 miles each way. Okay. And do you end up So sitting... in, in California terms, that can be anywhere from uh, 30 minutes to an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and here in the UK, I know there's lots of people who commute from, from say, Bristol, 120 miles into, into London and then, you know, back again. And something like this would work really well because it would be essentially a multimodal future. Um, Joe, I know that in Arizona, the distances are even bigger, but you tend not to have too much of a trouble with traffic, do you? 
Well, it depends. Uh, you know, when we had our uh, 500 year flood the other day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it shut down all the freeways and everyone just stayed home. But um, I think it's funny. This, this. Uh, I'm looking at the the image here on my uh, iPad. Uh, it looks almost as funky as that new uh, sort of adorable looking uh, self-driving car that Google you know, showed off like a month or two ago. I think self-driving, after kind of really thinking about the category, I think that self-driving cars, almost like, like these, like you talked about multimodal, will probably be a supplement to sort of the, the ultimate future transportation, things like SkyTran, mm -hmm. PRT, yeah. which is being looked at around the world and being built in um, Israel right now. Um, because ultimately, you'll still need the last mile you yes. know, from your house to somewhere. Um, but if I think ult in, in the far future, we're going to have less like personal vehicles on right. the road. We're going to have right. more things like this. But you always got to cover the last mile. Well, you see, I, so I can see it working the other way around. I can see it going in a multimodal situation where, for example, you drive from your home to the train station. You drive an mm -hmm. electric car, so you stop, you plug in, or maybe you have inductive charging in every parking spot. You get on the train, uh, the car knows what the next train's going to be, so maybe it buys a ticket for you and, and sends it to your device, your mobile device. You get on the phone, on the on the train, either by you know flashing your your watch or whatever. Uh, and when you get the other end, again, the system knows where you are, it knows you're on that train, it knows what time the train's going to arrive. And when you arrive, there's one of these little EMV, sorry, ENV. Uh, vehicles or something similar waiting for, you. waiting for you and it takes you to the office or you can rent a bicycle or etc etc and I think it's really great uh, the thing that's potentially um, very interesting about this vehicle uh, apart from its self-driving capability is the fact that it has vehicle to vehicle so it knows where other vehicles are on the road if they have a similar system so which obviously will avoid uh, accidents and it does have uh, conventional controls as well as automated driving capabilities it then has um, this uh, vehicle to infrastructure so it can talk to traffic lights and it knows when the traffic lights are going to turn red or whatever so it can be preemptive about that but it also has a vehicle to pedestrian um, so if there's someone who's working in the road for example a road worker they they have a special band on their wrist and it's a transmitter and it sends it to the car and says hello I'm in the road obviously law enforcement officers could wear, wear them as well that's a really good idea isn't it yeah I think so I Go ahead, Scott. I, the really cool tech that they're doing on it. Um, it, it it's prob this is probably just a demonstrator. The, the interesting thing, uh, when I was reading an article on it, it uh, with a uh, top speed of 25, I think what they're really saying is that they haven't built it structurally to actually be certified. Uh, so under 25 miles an hour in the U.S. means a neighborhood electric vehicle. Yes. Like the the gems and the other stuff. So it's it's probably like the... Google self-driving car, just a demonstrator for the tech. I don't think we'll ever see it, unfortunately. That's that's. I think you're probably right, which would be a shame, but I think you're right. All right, let's move. I, yeah. Sorry, go on, go Joe. Ahead. No, I just think uh, they have some innovative technologies, which I was reading about in other articles earlier this summer, and, and we're going to see some sort of confluence of all of the things that Google has developed and, and all the other companies have developed sort of converge in the next couple of years to make these self-driving cars possible because i just yeah. think one company it's 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 a very it's an enormous challenge to to make this work um near perfectly for just one organization to try to to pull that off yeah yeah absolutely um all right final final story of the segment how do you like hamsters gentlemen do you like hamsters they're cute <laughs> yeah. do you like full-size fairy hamster ladies well, maybe not. <laughs> she's she's a little creepy. <laughs> do, you, do you think she's a little she creepy? Would, she would be fine in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I have friends um, who who say she's very cute, and, and other friends who say. Ooh. Um, okay, so the Kia Soul EV, uh, as as we've talked about before, advertised by the full size hamsters, um, who I think are adorable. I I have a soft spot for those hamsters. Um, but uh, it's been given its official EPA range uh, this week, its official EPA rating, sorry, and it's also been priced $33,700 before an $800 mandatory shipping and handling fee and before state and federal tax incentives. Um, 93 miles on the EPA mixed cycle, gentlemen. But here's the interesting thing. Round town, over 100, and, I think it's 110 miles round town, 
um, 100, sorry, 103.6 miles on the urban cycle, which puts it at the top of any of the electric vehicles or mid-priced electric vehicles on sale today. How did they pull that off? Well, you only have uh, to look 27 at... 27 kilowatt battery. That's how they did it. Well, yeah. yeah you, you, you only have to look, though, at the shape of the vehicle. <laughs> the Kia Soul EV is not necessarily aerodynamic, is it? Let's be honest. No. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, they, they made it very efficient for round town, which I, I've got to hand it to Kia. That's perfectly designed because the Kia Soul has always been designed as, a, as an urban vehicle. It's designed for young people uh, who, you know, may be getting their first car. Um, designed for life in the city, uh, not really a long distance car, although this one has Chadamo quick charge capabilities, 6.6 .6 kilowatt onboard charger, um, and 93 miles on the EPA cycle is pretty darned good as far as I'm aware. But as, it is. as you allude to, Scott, it's not necessarily the most efficient, is it? No, yeah. So what, one of the things I, I like to do is I keep a, little, a spreadsheet of, of uh, all the cars that are out there and then you know divide their EPA by their total battery size to, to get mm. a, uh, an EPA watts per mile. Right. And they're, they're pretty low. So they're below a Tesla Model S 60. Yeah. Um, uh, and just above a Ford Focus EV. So they're, you know, they're, they're running in at about 290 uh, watts per mile. That's... So I think a lot of that is the is the the, the inefficient um, you know body style that they have. Yeah, that is pretty bad, isn't it? That is. That and is, is the vehicle obviously it's probably heavier with the the heavier battery, but it could be a heavier frame or design than because it's more of like a I don't want to really call it a mini SUV, but it's not exactly like a leaf. You know, it's, uh, it's a yeah I, different I, body style. I, 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 I agree. I think if you if you looked at it as a cheaper version of the Rav Four or the uh, uh, Mercedes B Class, uh, yeah. then yeah. I, I think it kind yeah. of fits pretty well in that zone. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think we're 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 going to be in a in a position in the future where um where we're going to be seeing uh, more and more cars like this coming into the market. But the thing that worries me is the compliance. It's compliance, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to be able to buy it in Arizona, are you, Joe? Probably not. Um, yeah, to be honest, buy it in California and ship it over. <laughs> I think, to be honest, yeah, Scott's exactly. going to be about one of the few people who could, sh should he want to, buy it, right, Scott? Yeah, that's uh, that. That's the you know the the great thing about California is that it, it, every car that wants to have a compliance car will come to California because uh, I think we're still where fifty percent of all new cars get sold into our state. Yeah, I mean, we just you just crossed over a hundred thousand plug-ins uh, last yeah. last month, so um, we didn't put that in the show notes, but it's worth uh, worth pointing out. Okay, we're going to have a quick ad break, and we will be right back for the third and final part of the show. So if you don't want to take out a monthly subscription you want to get something in return have you thought about trying our shop if you'd like one of these transport evolved logo top not like these because i'm keeping the polo shirts i'm sorry polo shirts are for people who write for us but uh, you can have a hoodie with a transport evolved logo on you can get an iphone case android phone case you can get baby grows all sorts with a transport evolved logo on jackets hoodies the whole lot and by going to www.transportevolved.com forward slash shop you can see all of the wares taking there and you go there and you buy uh, any of those um, pieces of apparel on offer and a little bit comes back to us we get a little bit of a commission every time one of those is sold comes straight to you at your home uh, handled by one of the more well-known t-shirt and apparel companies out there so if you want to support us and you don't want to take out a subscription uh, that's the way to do it of course if you don't have any money to spare, I know a lot of people are a bit strapped for cash at the moment, the other way of doing it is to spread the word and tell people about the show. If you like the new setup, you like the new studio, tell everybody about it. Uh, tell them to come to www.transportevolve.com. Spread the word on Twitter. Give us some thumbs up on Twitter or YouTube. Just spread the word. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because that helps too. On to the final part of today's show. And uh, we're going to talk about Galapagos Syndrome. Now, I hadn't heard of this one before. Um, had, have either of you heard of it? A Galapagos Syndrome, Joe? Does it have anything to do with the Galapagos Islands? <laughs> yes, sort of. Okay, so the best way of describing it is, you know, obviously the Galapagos, you have um, whole flora and fauna developing that you don't see anywhere else in the world, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the Galapagos Syndrome is a, a term used in Japan. 
to call to to to, to uh, def uh, define stuff that sells well in Japan but doesn't catch on elsewhere. So I suppose one of them would be those toilets that spray your bottom for you and then play a little song. Right. <laughs> that would be an example of Galapagos syndrome. Scott, have you heard of it before? Uh, I haven't, but as soon as I read it, I I I, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 that same kind of. Japanese people get it, the Japanese culture gets it, but nobody else does. And says uh, one of the Volkswagen uh, executives this week, uh, in fact, Volkswagen Japan's president, said that the hydrogen fuel cells might catch on in Japan, where they were going to be offering up to 3 million yen, which is, what, $30,000 in incentives per car. Uh, but they're not going to catch on elsewhere in the world, and it's a bit pointless. Um, that's quite brutal, but I think probably quite honest, isn't it? What yeah, I, I, you know, and hydrogen has all the uh, regular problems of any other kind of fueled vehicle. Uh, so, you know, it, it, unless they figure would figure out how to get the price way, way, way down, and it has come down over the last decade, but still, we're you know we're talking about cars that are as expensive as a as a Model S yet have the functionality of a Leaf. It just doesn't make any sense. But until, you know, if they were serious about it and they really were trying to get hydrogen, they would figure out a way to have uh, hydrogen filling stations at home. Yeah. You know, produced it's from your chicken, natural gas. It's a chicken and egg problem. It, it really is. And, and more so than electric vehicles, because at least people already have electricity at home. They don't have hydrogen. Uh, there was a... I used to follow a company, uh, and I think they're still around, but their, their, their goals changed. And one of their goals... They were based in Canada. They're, they're a hydrogen infrastructure company. And one of their goals was that they would have like a, a mini fridge size uh, device that you could hook up to your uh, home power and your garden hose, and it would become your hydrogen fueling station at home. It went nowhere. Um, I just think because the, the fuel cell vehicle went nowhere uh, at this point uh, for for where, where it, for all the talk that it's had over the decades, it just seems to be creeping along still. And I, I agree with Scott. I think that they were, if someone is actually serious about it, if someone's actually going to put serious money and effort behind it, then we'll see change happen. But until that, it's just, it's not there. I think it's one, sorry, Karen Scott. One, one of the one of the advances that they that they need to do is figure out how to move off titanium as the as the main metal used in the uh, fuel right. cell. Right, it's because uh, that, that's where a lot of the money expensive. is. expensive. Yeah, oh, it's it's interesting to know. I mean, I was at a, I was at an event this week and I drove a hydrogen combustion vehicle, which really? felt a bit weird actually. And I was talking to the guy who who was who was working on it and. This vehicle burns diesel, but then it also burns hydrogen. And he was trying to tell me how, how green it was and how they were going to create the, the electricity. They were going to use renewable electricity to, to, to create the hydrogen in a green way from water using electrolysis. And I was saying, that's kind of inefficient. And he, he didn't really, wasn't really prepared to answer that, that challenge. But the, the, the real challenge is the range of these vehicles is tiny. It's just like electric in terms of you know, your average range. Even this vehicle, the, 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 the Toyota Mirai, the, the fuel cell vehicle, is what, 300 miles per, per fill, which is, you might as well yeah. have a Tesla for that price. Well, Ford, Ford has a demonstrator they built years ago uh, out of a full-size pickup truck. Right. And, um, and this is the same, same thing as the one you, you drove. We had actually burns hydrogen. It's, there's no batteries or fuel cell in it. Uh, and in order to be able to get up a range of roughly 250 miles, they had to uh, fill the entire bed of the pickup truck with tanks. Oof. That's yeah, it just, from, it, from a physics point of view, uh, burning hydrogen just doesn't make any sense. And then from a you know cost point of view, yeah, because the fuel cells aren't that efficient, you have to have a battery anyway. And yeah. the size of the batteries in most of the uh, the prototypes they've built are well above 20 kilowatts. Oh, crikey. I, and I, I would assume that with the, even though we really haven't seen it necessarily, we hear all the things going on in the labs and that the new battery technology is going to be commercialized within the next 18 months, you know, whenever we're going to see these rapid um, changes in battery technology, not just for... Um, the charging, but you know the uh, energy density uh, and cost. I have a feeling that 
the hydrogen world is un until they solve these things and it could potentially overtake battery technology. I think it's going to be largely marginalized and irrelevant, really, in the in the vehicle world. Hmm. Yeah. I would say for 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 the at least for the next five ten years, uh, and if and if the battery technology world uh, industry uh, continues to adjust and adapt, then maybe it's going to become the dominant player. I mean, we know that uh, Tesla is still planning to have uh, at least, what was it, some of their stations, if not all their stations, to be battery swap stations. Um, so that could be something that, uh, if that really works the way it does and works economically, maybe that's the, the new thing that actually happens. I mean, mm. we see these things all the time in, in sci-fi movies. They, they refuel or change out big energy packs in like shuttles and things like that. I mean, I don't know. No, we, we never know if sci-fi is going to really work in real life um, uh, in our world uh, that we're currently living in, but maybe it will. Maybe. Maybe. be interesting to see what happens next. All right, let's move on to uh, the penultimate story, which is uh, Tesla uh, CEO Elon Musk. He went to Japan last week. He launched the Tesla Model S there and delivered it to, to a to, to a handful of new owners. Uh, also gave some hints that Toyota and Tesla will be working together again in the future, which was a complete bombshell to people who'd said, uh, you know, Toyota, Tesla, that's it, it's over. Um, also, interestingly, he took part in a, in a Japanese quiz show and, and tweeted a picture and said he had no idea what went on. I don't think he would be, uh, be alone in that one, Elon. Um, but the, the, the big story is that he said that Tesla Model 3 will come with some form of self-driving or autopilot technology when it launches in the market 2016 as a 2017 model year. Um, he didn't say what that would be, but it would be some form of semi-autonomous driving. I'm going to put my, my uh, I suppose I'm going to put my, 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 my finger above the parapet and say it's going to have, you know, some kind of city cruise control that is laser guided and allows you to have an adaptive cruise control. It's maybe going to have lane keep assist, um, probably self parking um, and possibly also emergency braking. I don't think it's going to be anything that we haven't already seen in other cars. Am I wrong, Scott? Uh, probably not. I mean, if you if you look at the Model S today, I think it's uh, it compares quite favorably to any of the other luxury cars except for those things. Uh, yeah, uh, all those things. Yeah. So I mean, they don't uh, there's no reason they they do. They did retrofit and stick on all the parking. Mm -hmm. uh, sensors mm. uh, but there's they for some reason they decided not to do all of the lane departure uh, you know adaptive cruise control all the all the things that you would expect in a car of that price so it would be really great if they do put that on both the model s and future versions as well as the as the model 3 and i would say uh, again i'm going to stick my head above the parapet and i would say that i would like to see every new car every new car that's sold around the world to have mandatory laser guided adaptive braking technology which means I it agree is with you 100%. impossible impossible for any new car to tailgate because if you think of how many accidents are caused by tailgaters and, and I've driven, and it's funnily, you, you should mention, you mentioned, Scott, that, you know, obviously the, the, the Tesla didn't have the technology that we would normally expect of a luxury car. I went from a Tesla Model S to the Volkswagen e-Golf. And the e-Golf has that city um, uh, uh, adaptive cruise control. And it means that the car will slow right down from 70 miles an hour. It will slow down to a stop. If you stop for more than half a second or so, um, the brakes... It, puts the brakes on hold and then all you have to do excuse me to, to move forward is to touch the accelerator or touch the the resume button and it will just carry on and it will keep a distance from the car in front it will keep the distance that you've set and it means that if the person in front suddenly stops your car can suddenly stop too and it's safe and it avoids tailgating and I think that should be a mandatory safety feature in all cars it's not that difficult to implement and all it would need to, no, to do would be to just take over from the braking of the person in front and say, OK, if that car is less than you know, traveling less than 15 miles an hour, then you can make the gap this distance. If the car in front is traveling at 30, then you can do this. And, and it would be fairly simple to do, I think, um, because the technology already exists. Um, but I, I would like to see more self-driving technology from Tesla. And I think the thing that excites me is that with Tesla, it's not about the hardware. It's about the software. That's where Tesla shines. 
And so what I imagine is that the Model 3 will launch with all of the sensors it needs to give it fully autonomous or, or nearly fully autonomous driving. And then Tesla will just roll out these software updates as it does with, with its Model S to add functionality as the car gets more and more uh, experience. And that, that's going to be awesome, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, I, I um, think we have uh, a lot of things. I, you know, and in some ways, although they do make announcements uh, more often than, say, Apple does, Tesla is one of these companies that you just you don't know quite what to expect from them. Mm. And I think we're going to continue to see great things. I mean, uh, heck, you know, what what's his next thing that he? I mean, obviously he's he's focusing on Tesla and SpaceX at this point, but uh, Elon is uh, has a very very long history of uh, starting organizations that have done radical and awesome things so mm, yeah who knows what's next what he's got up his sleeve i think we just have to play and we'll just have to play wait and find out all right scott you were going to say something there weren't you yeah i'm i'm wondering whether or not this is why uh the open source patent idea because I, I suspect that since all the other car companies have been working on these techs for so long whether it's radar or laser based uh that there probably are a lot of patents in that area yeah and that may, maybe that's what's been slowing down putting him in. Quite possibly. And, and that actually Probably. makes sense. That does make sense. All right, moving on to the final story of today. It's National Drive Electric Week next week, if you are in the US uh, at least. I don't think there's anywhere outside of the US holding it. There, are, well, Maybe there are a couple in Canada, but that's about it. Outside North America, how about that? Um, it's National Drive Electric Week for the entire week from tomorrow. And it's uh, a celebration of plug-in cars and uh, obviously future cars and Scott are you taking part? Uh, I I am that uh, there are lots of events it used to be a single event either on a Saturday or a Sunday and now it's an entire week's worth of events so I have to figure out how many I can actually get to. Excellent and are you taking your RAV or are you taking the LEAF or? Uh, the, the LEAF probably the LEAF yeah okay. it's the most convenient. <laughs> um, Joe are you taking part in any Yes, uh, we have. I think there's actually two here in the Phoenix area uh, wow. this coming Saturday. Uh, there was one uh, just at in Scottsdale. Now I believe there's also one in Mesa. So I'll be at the one in Scottsdale. I don't know uh, if I'm going to have, you know, like business cards or things to hang out to hand out about this uh, Blink campaign uh, or the boycott Blink campaign. Uh, but uh, it's a perfect place to inform people about it. So I'll probably have something to tell people about. Uh, the campaign there but yeah it was a lot of fun last year and i brought some friends up there and uh it was very well attended and uh, should be a lot of fun this year awesome awesome well i shall i shall look forward to hearing all about it and if you are taking part at home if you're watching at home and you're about to to go on one of these uh national plug-in week drive electric week sorry events do send me some photographs tell us about it because i i wish i could take part but i'm in the uk so sad panda. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. And thank you very much, Scott, for taking part. Joe, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can look me up on Facebook. You can check out my uh, lighting and home design, like LED and uh, lighting information series at answers.lighting. Uh, and there's no www or .com, just answers.lighting. And you can also check out all this information about the, um, the petition drive against blink and car charging and to avoid the use of public uh, commercial Blink uh, stations at boycottblink.org. And we're also on Twitter and Facebook right now. Awesome. Excellent. Scott, where can people find out about you? Oh, probably uh, Facebook and Google+. Plus. And we, we've got your Facebook link in the, in the lower third. I never know what to give okay. you for your lower third. So your Facebook link is in the lower third. But we've got links to your uh, Google+, Plus on, uh, on, on, uh, on the show notes as well. Um, as I say, I'm always in absolutely in awe of Scott because he gets to play games for a living. It's like everybody's favorite. I'm sure that's not really what you do, but uh, that's what it, that's what you do in my head. All day long, all day long, all we do is we play games. Yes. Well, I'm, I've just downloaded a, a new Bungie's latest game, Destiny, for for Xbox, and um, <laughs> it's been it's wonderful. Let's put it like that. I found out a friend of mine who works at YouTube told me uh, once that uh, he just watches cat videos all day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. 
that's it. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for watching. Don't forget you can find us on YouTube. Do subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on iTunes. Uh, you can also eventually find us on various other podcasting apps. And Monday through Friday, you can find us at www.transportevolved.com. Three to four stories every day. And then, of course, on a Friday, you get ten the 10 minute roundup of the news of the week although i've been doing it in about nine minutes lately so maybe i'll have to make it a little longer but then again this song this show is a little bit long so thanks for joining us and as always folks don't forget to plug in see you soon take care bye